This morning the scripture comes from Ephesians 5, 21 and chapter 6, verse 9. Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, be subject to your husbands as you are to the Lord. But the husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ is the head of the church, the body of which he is the Savior. Just as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her in order to make her holy by cleansing her with the washing of water by the word, so as to present the church to himself in splendor, without a spot or wrinkle or anything of a kind, yes, so that she may be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as they do their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hates his own body, but he nourishes and tenderly cares for it, just as Christ does for the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a great mystery, and I'm applying it to Christ and the church. Each of you, however, should love his wife as himself, and a wife should respect her husband. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, but this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise so that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. And fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling in singleness of heart as you obey Christ, not only while being watched, and in order to please them, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Render service with enthusiasm as to the Lord, and not to men and women, knowing that whatever good we do, we will receive the same again from the Lord, whether we are slaves or free. And masters, do the same to them, Stop threatening them, for you know that both of you have the same master in heaven, and with him there is no partiality. Words of God for people of God. My name is Kirk Nave. I'm one of the pastors here at Braddock Street United Methodist Church, and today we begin a new worship series just entitled Relationships. We will be looking at different kinds of relationships that we encounter throughout life, and today we will be looking at family. Let us pray together. Almighty God, you call us your children, and we are grafted into your family through the love of Jesus Christ. Thank you. And now open our hearts, our minds, our very souls to the movement of your Holy Spirit that we might learn to love one another as Christ has loved us. In Jesus' name, amen. I have to confess, when Kim was stumbling whether or not to, to read this, I thought it was because of the content. At the 845 service, the, the, the woman reader apologized. She said, just bear with me, it may be hard to read these words. It also reminds me when I was a young person, I, I'm kind of watching Sean go through this stage of life of when you're in your late 20s, early 30s, and all your friends are getting married. It seems like you're always attending somebody's wedding. And when I was in college, one of my friends, you know, turned around soon afterwards to get married, and we all gathered, and I noticed at the rehearsal dinner, 
my friend, if, if his fiance, soon to be his wife, didn't say exactly what he wanted her to say or behave the way he wanted her to behave, he would pull up a fake Bible and he would go, submit, woman, submit. It was all a joke, of course. I mean, there's, he has survived and they're both married still. But you can take a verse of Scripture here and there and get it what, to say whatever actually you would like it to say if you just pluck it out of its context. And very often we modern people ask questions of the biblical texts that the texts themselves were never attempting to answer. What's the role of men and women? What's the role of children in the house? There's really not that much said within Scripture. And if we read it at face value, is the submission of women the foundation of the family? Are children to obey their parents without question? Does Christianity sanction the institution of slavery? Context means everything when we read these. And one of the best lessons in context for me is an old joke that my Appalachian family used to tell from time to time. It's the story of an insurance case, a highway accident, where a farmer and his wagon, you know, the farmer was suing for damages from a car accident. And the case went all the way to trial. And the attorney representing the insurance company, you know, trying to get out of every potential liability, he said, sir, I just have one question for you. When the police officer arrived on the scene and inquired about your well-being, what did you say? Well, let me tell you. I was riding in my wagon, the horse pulling the wagon, the dog setting up beside me, and we're heading down this hill. He said, sir, let me stop you right there. I just want you to answer the question. When the state police officer asked you how you were, what did you say? Well, I'm fixing to tell you. So I was on my wagon, the horse pulling the wagon, dog setting up beside me, and we're coming down this hill, and here comes the, sir, I hate to interrupt you again, I just want you to answer the question. When the police officer asked you how you were, what did you say? If you'll please be patient, I'll get to it. So I'm riding on the wagon, horse pulling the wagon, dog setting up beside me, and we're coming down this hill, and here comes this car the other way, and sideswiped the wagon, knocked the wagon off into the ditch, of course the horse went with it, I was thrown up on the bank, and the dog was thrown even further. And I was unconscious. Next thing I know, I'm hearing the sirens as the police officer arrives on the scene. He walks up to the horse. He says, that horse has got a broken leg. He pulled out his revolver and he shot it. He walked up on the bank. That dog's in terrible condition. It's never going to survive. He pulled out his revolver and he shot it. He walked over to me and said, sir, how are you? I said, oh, I'm fine. Context means everything, right? The first verse here, verse 21, be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Then we go through this list of all the, re the uh, relationships that you might have found in an ancient household. Husbands, wives, children, parents, and finally, slaves and masters because that was a given in that time. So let's deal with the first one. Wives, be subject to your husbands. My oldest brother married a Southern Baptist. So she had to say obey, and he didn't in the vows. The vow for a woman to obey has not been a part of the United Methodist wedding ritual for over 100 years. You can look in the back of our hymnal. The wedding ritual is there. You'll find out that everything is an equal partnership. The wife, the husband say exactly the same things, make the exact same pro uh, promises because our understanding is it's just that, an equal partnership. Because you can't just stop with submit woman or wives be subject to your husbands. You go on to verse 25 and there's a longer section about the way husbands are to love their wives. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. What did Jesus Christ give up? His entire life for you and me and the church. Husbands, love your wives sacrificially. Be willing to die for your wife if you want to take it, right, all the way. It's a complete partnership where we are subject servants to one another. And I guess before I go on, sometimes I feel like I have to state the obvious because I still see this going on. 
Things like faithfulness in marriage, that's a given, friends. That's a given. Refraining from abuse, verbal and physical in a marriage, that's a given. That is not acceptable behavior in any kind of relationship. And I just feel like I have to say that up front. But marriage is an equal partnership. And the things that tend to cause tension in marriage, the top two that are mentioned in the studies that I read, number one is communication. Yes, you will have differences of opinion. Those of you who have not been married, those of you who are recently married, don't be surprised when you have a difference of opinion. Right? I found out very early on in my marriage that I have a much higher tolerance for dust and dirt and disorder in my home than my wife did. (laughs) Sounds like somebody resembles that remark. My wife might say something like, well, she didn't put it this way, but this is a healthy way to put it. I see that you're very comfortable with a big stack of dishes in the sink. I'm not. What are we going to do about it? Right? You name what is there. And notice whose problem it is in that case. It's not my problem. I'm perfectly comfortable with a big stack of dishes in the sink. It becomes her problem. But yes, we as a partnership have to work on that together. Not only the little things, but the big things. Another big point of contention and tension in, in marriages is money. My experience in my own household, when I've worked in businesses and churches, there's typically one person who's very good at stroking the checks and setting up online payments and whatever that is. But it has to be a partnership in forming the budget and staying in communication with one another about how money is handled. Because when things go south, maybe credit people start calling you in the home on the phone, there is a source of tension And one will blame another, and one will become defensive, and it begins to bring tension to the marital relationship. It's a partnership all the way, certainly with the little things, but more importantly with the big things. When I'm engaged in premarital counseling, among the questions that I ask, well, do you both want to have children? Because some people say, oh, we're in love, and haven't even had that conversation. And what if you get into a marriage, and this happened to a good friend of mine, he wanted, you know, 12 kids, he just loved kids. She wanted none. That marriage didn't stick together. How many children do you want if you want to have children? Another favorite question of mine is, where do you see yourself in 10 to 20 years? What are your life goals? Because you get into this idea of being subject to one another. There may be a season where one has to sacrifice for the other person's life goals. When I say sacrifice, I'm not talking about being a patsy for the other and always giving in so that you you know, have some kind of fake peace in the home. No, I'm talking about bringing the discussion up. For example, a, a good friend of mine was an attorney, and there was a season where he was going to put in extra, extra hours in order to make partner in his firm. So he and his wife talked about it ahead of time. First of all, they had to wait until the kids were a certain age before she could tolerate that. They had three girls within four years. And they figured it out. They worked a way where he could still make partner. But she had to sacrifice, take kind of the back seat, do a lot of the dirty work at home so that he could finish and make partner in his firm. Another dear friend of mine, they they wanted to raise their kids at home by themselves instead of doing the daycare or, or preschool thing. As much as they could, they wanted to do that on their own. And when they looked at it, she was making a whole lot more money teaching medicine at Georgetown Medical School than he was ever going to make. And this was... 35, 40 years ago, he decided he was going to be a house husband. That was not conventional back then. But they worked it out together. It's a partnership. And you discuss, how are we going to sacrifice? There may be a period, a short term, where one has to sacrifice for the other, for the other to reach their life goals. And the text goes on in chapter 6, verse 1, and it starts to meddle into children. Children got to love this one. Children, obey your parents. In the Lord obedience is based on trust have you found your parents to be trustworthy in most things and parents I'm not going to advise this but there may be a moment where your mom or your dad or your grandmom or stepmom or whatever says because I'm your mother that's why and in that moment because they hadn't figured it out yet you're gonna have to trust and obey But it says obey in the Lord. Of course, you don't want to become a person of age and your parents have asked you to do something unethical. No, it's up to the child, the teenager, the young adult to speak up to the parent 
and hold the parent accountable. Children, in my experience, my kids were great at holding my wife and I accountable. They were like mirrors, you know, showing us the way we were living. But Dad, you said... One of my favorite stories was my nephew. My sister-in-law had decided she was hearing too much bad language at home. So she got this big pickle jar and she set it on the kitchen counter. She said, every time I hear a bad word, you're going to put a quarter in that jar. And the quarter started to pile up. And then it was a little bit slower, you know. After about a month, my nephew said, Mom, put a quarter in the jar. (laughs) Holding one another accountable. Mutual respect. I would say to any of you who are young parents or thinking about having children someday later in your life, the best decision my wife and I ever made was taking a parenting class. We did that while we were still pregnant with our first child. It wasn't offered in a church. It was offered at the local hospital. It just so happened that the leader of the seminar was a retired Baptist preacher and his wife, and they were fantastic. They taught us all the little ins and outs. We got on the same page. We understood principles like borders you know but freedom within those boundaries freedom within limits kids can have all kinds of fun and the parents have to get on the same page about what the limits are and why they are there because most of the time just saying because your father said so isn't good enough kids need to understand why the limits are there and oh by the way we found out kids will test the limits just to see if they're there kids like predictability they like safety And if you've talked about why the limits are there, then you get into, I remember having this conversation in my head. Okay, am I about to blow up because I'm just being annoyed or is this a safety issue? And I checked myself. Just because a child was making noise wasn't bad behavior. It just meant I have a headache right now and this is not what I want to hear. And so I calmed down. Parenting is probably the most important role I think that a human being can ever do. To bring a child into the world, to form that child, to shape that child. Is there anything more important? And so the text goes on in chapter 6, verse 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. At this phrase, I want to apologize to any of you. I know I've counseled a lot of people who are adults walking around with post-traumatic stress disorder because their parents disciplined in a way that was, I would say, not acceptable. I would call these children, now adults, victims. And it was done in the name of Christian family values. Did you know, spare the rod and spoil the child is found nowhere in all of Scripture? The words were written by a fellow by the name of Samuel Butler in the 1600s in poetry. And what he was talking about, if you read the whole thing, had nothing to do with parenting. You will find in Proverbs 13, verse 24, those who spare the rod hate their children, but those who love them are diligent to discipline them. And that's the purpose, discipline. It's the same root word that we have for disciple. It's about learning and teaching. It may or may not come with punishment, right, to teach. Do you always have to punish in order to teach? One of my most memorable moments as a parent was when my son did something bad. I won't go into it because I don't want to be that preacher that talks about his kids mistakes mine were worse but I remember his angst I remember his anxiety his guilt his tears and sitting with him and talking through it he knew that what he had done was wrong and I found myself saying in that moment son I am not nearly as worried about what you have done as what you will do in the future what lesson are you going to learn from this mistake I just don't want to see you do it again. Guess what? He never did it again. I don't remember how we might, what punishment or discipline we might have used beyond that. I remember that moment and I remember getting the sense that he understands what I'm talking about. Discipline is the point. And what I learned in parenting class is make the punishment fit the crime. If a child can't use a toy properly, perhaps that toy needs to be taken away for a time. Teenager. Right? If you're not going to use the car responsibly, you're going to lose your driving privileges. These kinds of things make sense. If you use brute force, what are you going to teach? You're going to teach the one that is most powerful is always right. 
and one has the ability to hit and the other has to suffer. Is that parenting? So do not provoke your children to anger, fathers or mothers. And that bit about honoring your father and your mother is not so much about children and teenagers being obedient, it's about adult children taking care of their aging parents. And I don't want anybody to walk away feeling guilty because that's, that's a tough spot to be. The people who are in between, taking, trying to raise children at the same time trying to take care of aging parents. That's a lot of work. And it's hard. But this was written when there was no Medicaid, no Social Security. It was the responsibility of the family to take aging parents into the home and care for them for the rest of their lives. Even in my father's generation, I remember them talking about taking in a grandparent, a great uncle, somebody to, to just take care of them because there weren't any decent nursing homes, nor could they afford them. Notice how this text, if you read the whole thing, and thank you, Kim, for reading it all, it goes into every relationship. It even says, slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling. This is one of those texts that was taken on by Methodists and other Protestant preachers in the American South to validate the institution of slavery. I've read some of those sermons. Blacks Slaves were allowed to sit in the balcony of a church or in the back row or listen through the windows. That was the only place that they were allowed to come to church if that church was going to preach this kind of understanding, that slaves were to be submissive and peaceful and not threaten their masters. When you take it in the context that slavery was an institution at the time that was readily accepted, you understand these are kind of radical words to say slaves, not just while you're being watched, but do your service for the Lord. Your service is to God, to look at it a different way. And then, of course, the text goes on to say, Masters, do the same to them. For with God, there is no partiality. In God's eyes, slaves and masters are equal. What a radical thing to say 2,000 years ago. And when you read all of this together, you understand it goes back to that first verse 21, be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ, to love one another in radical ways that society has never told you. That's why we have this visual here today. Diane Kelly put this together. We put it up on the screen if you're sitting in the back row. And it's simply the frame of a home, and you've got parents, children who are dependent, the colors are different because, you know, today, families don't look the same. When I was a kid, <laughs> I grew up in a white neighborhood. All the kids were white. I had two parents. They had three kids. We had a dog. Now we've got biracial couples, right? We've got stepchildren. We've got grandparents raising children. It's all different now. But the piece that is key is what's in the back. That's the figure of Jesus Christ. When the love of Jesus Christ is in the midst of the home, and people are learning to love one another, not thinking so much first for themselves, but always for the other, to love sacrificially, then the house can breed even miracles. Sometimes I'm humbled when I think about sacrifices that were done by previous generations in my own family. I wonder if I were standing here today, if my grandfather had not made a, a promise to his children. This is my paternal grandfather. Those of you that know my father, this was his dad. I didn't know him very well. He was, I think I was a half year old when he died. I never really heard my father talk about what he did for the railroad. And one time while visiting family there in eastern Tennessee, my uncle said, yeah, this is where your grandfather checked the grease boxes. I said, what do you mean? He would stand here by the rail while the coal train moved slowly by. This was the Clinchfield Railroad. And he had a steel rod with a hook on it. And he would flip this lid that was in a box in between the two axles on every train car and make sure that there was grease in the grease box to grease the axles on the railroad train. Now, I don't know what that work was like, but I'm guessing he didn't need a degree in engineering to do it. Blue-collar guy. The way the family made most of their money was mom and the four kids ran the farm while he did the work at the railroad to make more money. And in the midst of the Depression, glad to have the work. He made a promise to each of his four children. He said, I will give you the money to go to college. Now this is 
right after the Second World War, the 1940s, most folks didn't go to college. I will give you the money to go to college because people might steal from you, you might lose everything in a fire, but nobody can steal your mind. That was his rationale. So two of the four kids took him up on it. My father being one of them, we went off to college and went to graduate school and so forth. And so I was raised in a beautiful, country, comfortable home and was able to go to college. My father paid for my college and so forth. People made sacrifices so that others might live better. I've got a nice definition of sacrifice here I'd like to share with you. I learned this years ago. Sacrifice isn't about being a patsy for somebody else. It's not about always giving in, but having the discussion so that the best can happen for everyone. Sacrifice is giving up something important so that something more important can happen, right? A rail, common railroad worker who's giving up all of his life savings for his children so that something more important, his children can have a life, a better life for years to come. And when I think about sacrifice within the family context, there's one father and son that I often think about, and it's Dick and Rick Hoyt. I'd like you to watch this video. You can Google Dick and Rick Hoyt and get multiple videos. They've been on Oprah Winfrey and so forth. It's a rather famous story. But the back story perhaps might even mean more. If you noticed, he, his son was 19 when he asked. And that's when they started. The father, Dick, said, I was a bit overweight when I started. And I began the training all for my son, Rick. Later on, he had a cardiac issue. The doctor examined him and said, if you were not in such good shape, you would have died a number of years ago. So Dick says, Rick saved my life. Sacrifice is giving up something important so that something more important can happen. Are you sacrificing for the people that you love in your life? Are you willing to give up your own joy for a season so that something more important might happen in someone else's? All of our relationships are founded on the love that God has for us in Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for the incredible way that you have loved us in Christ, giving of yourself so that we might have that abundant life that we find in Christ alone. I pray for every family, every relationship that is represented in this room. Help us to see one another as you see us, as your children, worthy of your love and sacrifice. May we be, di be willing to do whatever is necessary for all of us to find happiness together. We pray also, Lord, this morning for folks who are having a difficult time. As We pray for John Capehart and Josephine Crane, for Ed Orndorff, the Flagg family, for Harold Ogg, for Alyssa, Michael, and Aaliyah Farquhar, for Soup Hilliard, for Kate Rudolph, for the Shockey family, for Ellen Adams, for Ellen Cavanaugh's mother, for B. Adams, for Bryce Newland. For Robbie Robinson, Scott Jackson, the family of Frank Shader, for the family of Nick's, Nick Simples, for the family of Winnie Hockman, for Harold Madigan, for Denny Bromley, for George Quarles, for Buddy Orndorff, George Morris, Wayne Dick, Wendell Dick, Georgia Colors, Jessica Marlowe, Dick Harmison, Mrs. George Dove, the family of Buck Merritt, for Strother Adams. Gary Belford, J.T. Heil, Chris Reinhardt, Miles Orndorff, and others whom we name in our hearts. And God, we pray for those whom we do not know by name. We pray for migrants throughout the United States and on the southern border. We pray for people suffering flooding in the Gulf Coast. We pray for our nation's troops and their families, and we pray for peace. We pray for our communities homeless, for those who are struggling financially. We pray for Braddock Street United Methodist Church, Lord. You have called us to be a blessing for others. Keep us ever focused, not on ourselves, but upon others, just as Christ was always focused on others. 
May our church be a witness of the love of God in our community that is obvious and invitational. These prayers we offer in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has also taught us to pray as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.